Okay, so welcome back to another lecture on finding derivatives. In the previous lecture, we covered one of the most important rules, right? So, and this rule is going to be fundamental for what we do today. So we have to recall that rule. So this is from lecture nine. This rule is called the chain rule. Okay. And there's like a lot of conditions on, on these like y is a function of u and u is a function of x, things like this. So like the two ways that we were writing this, um, so, so dy dx is equal to um, that dy du. So I misspoke earlier. Y is a function of u, a differentiable function of u, and u is a function of x. So this was using Leibniz notation. The other notation was that. Um, the derivative with respect to x of the composite function of f composed with g. I said this a few times last time. It's the derivative of the outside function times the derivative of the inside function. So derivative of the outside, just f prime of g of x times the derivative of g. Right, so this is just two different ways of writing the same concept. Okay. Now, fundamental for today's lecture. So if there's anything missing and you forgot how that works, as I'm lecturing, please stop me and say, and like, I'll remind you the details as we're going through it, because we just covered that. It's new. Right. So we need an example problem to motivate today's lecture. So consider the graph of the equation say x squared plus y squared is equal to 25. Okay. So what type of equation, like what does the graph of this equation look like? Oh, come on. I heard it. Someone said circle, right? Remember, I was like, this is like one of my favorite equations. X squared plus Y squared is equal to the radius squared. So this is a circle with radius five centered at the origin. So one, two, three, four, five. Try my best to. I guess this is going to kind of ugly, but roughly like that, right? That's what it looks like. And in physics and in modeling problems, you will encounter equations like this. Now, up until now, when we've been taking derivatives, um, well, not up until now, but just generally when taking derivatives, derivatives are defined on functions. That's not a function, that's an equation, right? But suppose we wanted to maybe find the slope of the tangent line like here, right? Or maybe we wanted to find the equation of that line, right? At that point. So what's a, what's a possible pair as a solution to this equation? Zero comma five, right, is a solution. X is zero, Y is five, what's another one? So three squared is nine, four squared is 16. That works, right? 
3 comma 4. If x is 3, 9 plus 16 is 25. So maybe that point right there is like 3 comma 4. Oh, it actually looks like it. <laughs> That's I, I did not do that on purpose. It's like almost perfectly lined up with 3 comma 4. So maybe we're asked to find the equation of the tangent line to this curve at the point three comma four. So that's like the task that we've been given. So in order to find the equation of a line, we need, well, a point, and we also need a slope. So to determine the slope of that tangent line right there, we, we have a tool called a derivative, but that's not a function, right? So maybe, maybe one way that we could do this was, would be to write that equation, like solve for y and see if we can somehow write y as a function of x. So maybe, maybe, so x squared plus y squared is equal to 25, which means that y squared is equal to 25 minus x squared which means that y is equal to plus or minus the square root of 25 minus x squared. So we've written y on one side of this equation and then we have x on the other, but still that's not a function, right? The definition of a function is that a value for x gets sent, so no x gets sent to two different values, right? But no matter what x you put in here, you're going to get two different values, a plus and a minus, right? So that's not a function. But what this is telling us is that maybe we can piece this up and make a function. So like um, maybe y is equal to the positive part or y is equal to the negative part. So this one, the positive part, are the y values that are positive. So it'll be like here. So that right there, that curve, would be y equals to the positive part. And that is a function. It's no longer returning two different y's for one x. The negative one would be down here. Like that. So which one is it that we would maybe consider to help us find the slope of that line? The positive one, right? So we would focus in on this one. And then we can apply the derivative on both sides of this equation. Right? The, the, the derivative is an operator, right? We can apply it to things. So dy dx is equal to the derivative with respect to x applied to this thing here. Now last time, and maybe I got a question about this from a student one time, um, when you see radicals and you want to take derivatives, write it as an exponent, right? So that you can apply the power rule. So that right there looks like 
25 minus x squared to the power one half. Right? Okay, so now we can apply the chain rule. Right? Well, this is a composite function. It's x to the uh, uh, u to the power one half is the f function. And then inside is 25 minus x squared. That's our u function. So if we do that, the derivative of the outside, well, we apply the power rule. One half times this whole thing. And then one half minus one. Minus negative one half. There you go, negative one half. But we can't forget times the derivative of the inside, which is negative two x. Perfect. So if we like kind of rearrange this, we get um, notice the one half and the negative two it becomes negative one, right? So this will be negative x over the square root of 25 minus x squared. And that negative exponent, we look at its reciprocal, so it's one over this value, and then this one half is just a square root. So now that we have this value here, we look at the x value of this point and we, we plug it in. So then um, the slope of that line is going to be what? Negative 3 over the square root of 25 minus 3 squared, which is equal to negative 3 over square root of 25 minus 9, which is equal to negative 3 over the square root of 16, right? And that's just negative 3 fourths. Okay. So now that we have the slope, we're done. Right, the equation of the line, this now, the equation of this tangent line is. So y minus the y in question, which is 4, is equal to the slope times x minus the x in question. The slope is negative 3 fourths. Mm -hmm. yeah. I didn't ask you to put it in any specific form. I just asked for the equation. And that is the equation. You just have to recall, you have to remember that the equation of the line is y minus y1 is equal to m times x minus x1. So it's like from college algebra. That's the equation of the line. I just substituted in the slope and the y and the x. Okay. So notice now that. When, when doing this, we had to take this equation, we had to solve for y, then we had to look at the thing and try to decide like which of these y's was the function that we needed to use for the problem. What if this was not so nice looking, right? And you didn't have like a graphing utility to help you figure out what it was. Or even, what if you couldn't solve for y? There was like no way to solve for y on one side of the equation. How would you go about doing this? So that idea that I just mentioned is called implicit differentiation. 
and gets rid of these types of problems that we might encounter when doing it the way that we know how to do it. Okay. So hopefully all of you have written that down. Can you explain again how you got the negative x over the square root of two plus x? This one? Yeah. So this equation here becomes this. One half times one over 25 minus x squared all to the power of one half. Messy, fix that. So there's a one half there, right? The exponent becomes positive mm -hmm. times negative two x. Can you see it now? Yeah. One half divides out that two, so it's just negative x in the numerator. And then in the denominator, you have the square root of that. Oh. Got it? Yeah. Yeah, thank, thank you for pointing it out. I'm, I'm almost positive you weren't the only one that might have been confused from there to there. Okay, so this is the solution. We know the solution. Okay, um, so in fact, I can probably write the full solution just in this little spot now. So I'm going to do the other way. Okay, so now this is my method. of implicit differentiation. And that's the topic of today's lecture. All right, so how does this work? One. Assume y is a function of x. Okay, and we just don't know what it is, right? We have no idea what it is. We just, we're assuming that there is a way to express y as a function of x. Right? So here, we explicitly found a solution for it. This is an explicit equation. It's there in front of you. Here, we're assuming that y is a function of x, and we don't know what it looks like. Okay, so then step two. So take the derivative of both sides of the equation. with respect to two x. Take both sides. So this is an equation. Take the derivative on both sides with respect to x. I think that's how your textbook would read it. I, I don't like it really, the way that that reads, because Taking the derivative with respect to x sounds like you're like taking you're, you're taking it on some function. Okay? My preferred wordage would be apply the derivative as an operator on both sides of the equation because I've been using that terminology. Apply it to the equation. The derivative with respect is an operator on both sides of the equation. Right? Like literally, when I wrote this right here, I took that and I said dx d dx times that times, but it's like applying, right? And d dx times that, it's like applying. And then if I do that, it's what it looks like. So we're going to do the same thing with that. 
So let's just do that. And we don't need any of this business anymore. So there's my equation. So I'm going to say, okay, d dx, apply this linear operator to both sides of the, the equation. Right? Apply it to both sides of the equation. And again, I don't know how many times I'm going to say this, the derivative is a linear map, meaning it distributes over sums. So here, on the left-hand side, this becomes derivative with respect to x applied to x squared, plus the derivative with respect to x applied to y squared. And then on the right-hand side, the derivative with respect to x applied to a constant is just what? Right, zero. Oh, I forgot to write another part down here for the instructions. Take the derivative of both sides of the equation with respect to x, and then part three, solve for dy dx. And note that dy dx is the same thing as y prime. It doesn't matter if it's notational differences. All right, so back here, that's our goal now. We're going to try to solve for the derivative of y with respect to x. I don't see it anywhere. I don't see dy dx anywhere. So um, let's just work our way through and see what we can. What's this derivative here? 2x, right? The derivative with respect to x of x squared is, is just 2x. Now, here's the thing that might throw you all off. The derivative of y squared with respect to x. What are we assuming that y is? It's a part one in this list. Y is a, it's a, function it's a function of X, right? So if Y is a function of X, right? Then think of this like, think of it like this, like, um, like F of X equals to Y or something, right? And then like G of X equals to X squared or something. Right. So then if you did the derivative with respect to x of um, g composed with f of x, right? Isn't that the same thing? Right? G composed with f is just you put that right there, right? This is exactly that. If, if, if I let that be that and let that be that. And we know what this derivative is. It's the derivative of the outside times the derivative of the inside, right? So the derivative of the outside is like something squared. What's the derivative of something squared? Two times the something. Two times that something. And the inside, the inside is y, and y is a function of x. The inside is dy dx, exactly. We don't know what it looks like. We just know that the, we're taking the derivative of the inside function, right? And we're assuming that y is differentiable function of x. Oh, I need to be very careful right here. Is a differentiable function of x. I think I might have said it out loud, but I just wrote function.
a differentiable function of x. Because otherwise, that would make no sense to write that notation. So again, just think of it like, what's g prime of x? It's 2x, but we're keeping f in there. So it'd be 2y, right? Times dy dx. That's it. So now we have that, and we can solve for that derivative. So what does this become? So 2y times dy dx is equal to negative 2x. Divide both sides by 2. Divide both sides by y. And we get that dy dx is equal to x over y. Negative, sorry, negative x over y. Now, this is interesting to me because we haven't really encountered such a, an obvious place where the derivative might not exist. If the derivative of y with respect to x is equal to that ratio, where is there no derivative? Y equals zero. Perfect. This value, right? This, if I plug in an x and a y, it's a point on the curve somewhere. Okay? And at that point where y is equal to zero, this is not defined. And if you look at it, y equals zero, where does that occur? Here and there. What's the slope of the tangent line there? It's infinity. It doesn't exist. So this function we found through solving for this, the derivative in this way, we see that, oh, that's like the derivative. We can't, if we wanted to know the slope of the tangent line of y equals zero, x equals zero, we couldn't find it. It's infinite, okay? But everywhere else, we're okay. Every, every other place. And look at how much like this tells you um, where is the slope of the tangent line flat? When x is zero. When x is zero, it's flat, right? But we don't have to look at the picture to know that. Looking at that tells me that. If x is zero, it doesn't matter what y is. The slope of the tangent line is zero. So flat, flat. That's, that's, those are the points where x is zero. It tells us a lot. And now we're, we're done. We want to know the equation of the tangent line. It's just this. Y minus 4 is equal to M. So the slope at that point is just what? Negative 3 fourths. Times X minus 3. So this would be easier to do instead of doing It depends, right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes when you, you're given an equation like this, sometimes it's more difficult to solve for y than it is just to apply this method. Sometimes it's easier, right? Like if my equation looked like this, like y minus x is equal to two, I don't have like, why would I, they just do it normally, right? It just depends. It's just another technique in your back, okay? But you, it, it will become obvious in most cases, right? Like you'll have a, an equation that looks like a mess, right? So for example, let's, no, I got distracted. Before I move on, I want to ask you if we can find the same solution by treating x as a function of y, right? Like, think about it. Starting from there, we could solve for x, and we would have an equation for x. And then the variable would be what? y. So x is a function of y. That means we could take the derivative of that variable. We've been using x a lot, but that doesn't mean we always have to. So let's just see what happens when we do that. And it'll be easy to, to repeat here. 
just see what happens and see if we come up with the same solution. So now I'm taking the derivative with respect to y. And I'm assuming that x is a function of y. Okay, that's a differentiable function of y. Be very careful about that. So again, derivative is a linear map, so I can just distribute this operator in. Derivative of the variable y for a constant, zero still, doesn't matter. All right, so what's the derivative here? Hopefully, I'll get one answer. <laughs> Perfect. I'm all of you said it. Perfect. So this will be 2x times dx dy. And then the derivative here, it's just 2y. And now we want to solve for the derivative, right? So this will become 2x times dx dy is equal to minus 2y. And then dx dy is equal to negative y over x. That's the same formula for the slope. Okay. So this is if y, if x was a function, a function of y. So basically, it's like, it's, it's yeah, it's, it's the same thing. Yeah. No, it's the same. Regardless, the last, the last derivative we got for that curve was the same. It was negative y over three. Um, hold on, let me, let me see. Was it? Let's make sure. Three comma four. So this will be actually. No, you're right. What is going on here? Let me see. Three four over three. Ah. That's what it is. I miss. I misspoke. So, can someone explain to me what's happening here? Or so, what is that actually like? This is a. This is actually a good exercise. It even tripped me up because I don't think about it often. But what's the difference here for this curve here? Like, what did we do earlier? We had y is equal to plus or minus root uh, 25 minus x squared. And then we have, if we did the same thing for x, it's x plus or minus root 25 minus y squared. So that's, that is a function, right? It might actually help me to do this. Okay, so this is setting ourselves in the axis x, y this way, right? So these are the positive values of x, those are the negative values of x, these are the positive values of y, these are the negative values of y, right? So, okay, let's figure this out. Oh, maybe I should be more specific about what we're figuring out. What does that look like and how do we visualize it? <laughs> it, it we can figure this out, right? Let's, let's just try it out. And I think it will become apparent if I do this. Okay, so now here's y, here's x. It looks the same when you do this, right? You'll get the same exact, like, like that. 
So now we just have to orient ourselves on here somehow to figure out how things translate, right? So, oh, wait a minute. You confused me. So, not your fault. Thank you for doing it. This is kind of entertaining for me. Um, I like it when I get to interact with you, even like if I say something wrong or you confused, we'll figure it out. So can anyone tell me what was the mistake that I made when I had dy dx equals to, what did I have? It was negative what? Y over x? Uh, which one? The last one that I had right here. Yes, negative y over x. Okay. So when I had, oh no, sorry, this was dx dy. Yeah. dx dy. And then dy dx. Right. Now it's just, it has to do with how we feed in functions, like how we like look at values outputted by functions. Tuples, the ordering matters, right? We always say x, y, right? We always say x, y. But if we're looking at it, so maybe this is like the biggest mistake that I didn't write down, I should have. Assume that x is a function of y. Which means that the points on that graph look like this input, output. Here, this was input was x, output was y, right? That's what we were assuming when we were given the problem. But the points on this function are given by y, comma, x. So that means that we would have three there, right? Um, four there. Did we did we figure out the, the, the problem? <laughs> it's just because the tuples, the first entry is your input to the function, the second entry is your output. So because we're so trained on x and y being the x there, y there, we didn't think. <laughs> so you're telling me it was x in the d in the dx over dy if it was negative y and y is gonna be three over four yeah, it's, 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 it's all the same. Yeah, yeah, because the points, the points for this type of function look like that. The points for that type of the, the y look like that. So we have to switch them. So um, in either case, if we were careful and I wasn't getting so excited, we would have caught that. But I'm glad that we did discuss it, right? It emphasizes an important point that because like, the notation is like so standardized, right? I even like made a point to, to mention this to you, to you guys in a previous lecture. Think before you do, right? Didn't I like really emphasize like, think about what you're doing before you act, like what's happening, right? And if we would have done that, we would have been thinking, oh, the changes in X over the changes in Y which means that x is the output, y is the input, which means that our points look like that. <laughs> yeah, I, hopefully it makes sense why I was so perplexed when I thought I was wrong the first time. <laughs> I knew that it should work, I just, it's easy to get confused when we're always using x in one place and y in the other. But again, these are just ideas, input, output. That's better, a better way to think about it. Okay. So that was fun. Let's do another one. Now I forgot my example notes in my office. So I'm going to have to think of one and hopefully it works out. So maybe class is going to be not the easiest thing to do. Um, 
So find y prime. That's dy dx, by the way. Same thing. Um, if y, so if sine of x plus y equals, and here's where I have to be very careful. Um, and the reason why I'm being very careful is because sometimes, just like you can't solve for the original equation y, sometimes you can't solve for dy dx. So I'm trying to come up with an example where we can at least solve for dy dx. That's, that's not trivial. So plus And that that should work. Actually, hold on. Let me, let me make sure. Um, yeah, that, that that should work. Okay. Maybe I'll make this like. Hold on. Let's see. Maybe x squared times y cubed. Does that work? Well, we can try to solve for it, but the, the, the process of trying to solve for it, you'll see all the techniques that are needed. I don't know about this one, actually. We'll see. Okay, so solution, maybe. All right, so we have to pick what we're going to do. Um, well, in this case, we're, it's telling us to explicitly find y prime. We need an equation for that somehow. Right? So we just apply the derivative with respect to x as an operator on both sides. Oh, this might work. Yes. Yeah, okay, that's the first step. Hey, there's like partial credit right there. Let's do that. Okay. So now we got to figure out the, the, the messy stuff. So here, what are we going to do here? Well, there's a sign right there. It's a function, right? Is a function composed with another function. So we have to use the chain rule. So the derivative of the outside is the same thing as the derivative of cosine, right? I mean, sorry, the derivative of the outside is the same thing as cosine. So on the left hand side, we'll have cosine of x plus y. That's the derivative of the outside piece times the derivative of the inside piece. Derivative of the inside piece is just one plus dy dx. Or this problem is using y prime. Y prime. Same thing as dy dx, right? That's times, right? Yeah, yeah. And then here we have to apply this product rule, right? So would be two x times y cubed plus x squared times the derivative of this guy. What's the derivative of y cubed? Almost, we're missing something. Three y squared, then what? Yeah, dy dx or just y prime. Exactly. All right, so this is just messy algebra now. The left-hand side becomes cosine of x plus y plus um, y prime 
times cosine of x plus y. And then the right hand side stays the same. 2x times y cubed plus 3x squared y squared times y prime. Yeah. All right, so we have to solve for y prime. I think the easiest way, um, I guess I can move this piece, cosine of x plus y onto the right-hand side and move this piece to the left-hand side. So I'll get, if I do that, y prime times cosine of x plus y, minus 3x squared y squared times y prime is equal to 2x y cubed. And then minus cosine of x plus y. Yeah, do you have to take, so there was a comment that this is, this is long. Um, do you have to take Cal 2? Okay, that's where you get, that's the worst one. Yeah. Quick question before you keep going. Um, earlier you times cosine with the inside of that with the y. So here. How come you didn't do the x plus y times one? So what's the derivative of this? So with respect to x, what's the derivative of x? It's just one, right? And then y, it's just the function of x. So mm -hmm. I just write y prime instead of d, y, dx. Uh, earlier, you put, right there down the bottom, you put cosine of this and then cosine times y prime with the inside. Yeah, so I just distributed. Cosine of x times one is that, plus cosine of, cosine of x plus y. Why didn't you do like the bubble times the bubble? Oh no, cosine's applying this. This is its own thing. And I distributed it into this sum. It's like, this is, this is connected with that cosine. It's like a function evaluated at it. But thank you for asking, because that means we can clarify anything in a second. Oh. All right, so we're close. We factor out y prime next. So, Actually, whenever I have multiple like uh, brackets, I usually use the, the hard brackets instead of the round brackets, so parentheses, uh, just to make the reading of it easier. So we have y prime times together cosine of x plus y minus three times x squared times y squared, close bracket, right hand side stays the same. And then we divide. So in the end, we get this. So 2x times y cubed minus cosine of x plus y, all divided by cosine of x plus y minus 3x squared times y squared. And that's it. We were able to do it. Not terrible. Good question, because you're not the first student to ask me this recently. And I'm, we're about to have like a tangent, like a hard tangent right now, back to some, some concepts, because I understand why you would say that completely, because as many of you know, or some of you know, like I struggled with math myself when I was like starting off, 
right? And this one concept of cancel out, I don't even like saying that term cancel out. Notice that I always say divide out. You never hear me say cancel, it's always divide out. There's a reason for that because it's descriptive. So again, this is a tangent. If you're watching on Zoom, some of you might not know, but like we're gonna nail down why you can divide out. That's the solution. Um, and this will be like a little side tangent. So if I have something like A, B over A, why is that just equal to B? It's not descriptive enough. What do we know about fraction multiplication? It's the numerators times the denominators when you multiply two fractions. Well, what I'm getting at is that that fraction, that ratio, is the same thing as this. It's the same thing. What number is that? That's a one. And B divided by one is just B, right? B. So when people do that, what they really mean is that there is a multiple of one somewhere in that ratio, which means that if we consider this, now this is not a product, right? This is a sum. Like, and just to illustrate, maybe I'll do this simple example again. Let's look at this one. Why can you not divide out the A's now? How could we write this as a multiplication? Yeah. So multiply. So you'd be changing it unless you multiply by like one, right? You can only ever multiply by one. But like, why can you not divide up that A? How could you write that thing as a product where you have a multiplication of one anywhere? The only operation I can see that you could do is maybe this. That's the only thing I could, I could say to split that up, right? So this becomes what? One over, I mean, one plus B over A. That does not equal B, right? It doesn't. And it's because there is no factor. You can't factor out of one. So think about it like that. Whenever you say cancel, which you should stop saying and say divide out, you can only do that when you can factor out something in the numerator and denominator at the same time. If you can factor those out, that's a one. And then you can reduce, divide them out. So looking here, I cannot factor out. This is a sum right here. There's no common factor between two of these. There's no common factor there. I can't factor anything out. There's nothing I can simplify. Right, just like here, there is no common factor to factor out between there to make it multiply. Is that clear? Yeah. So the, to answer your question in a long-winded form, the reason why we can't is that there's no common factor between these two numbers. You can only divide out common factors. So for example, like just to like one more illustration of it, like so 2a b squared minus a b squared over a b squared. Can you can you can you cross out? Don't say that word. Can you divide out anything? It, ask yourself, can you factor anything out? You can actually in the you could factor out just a b squared. Let's let's just do that.
actually um let me make this a two right there so a squared right there because honestly this is just one a b squared right these are right terms so i put a square there so that that can't happen so and in the denominator multiplication the order doesn't matter right but i'm still going to write it like a times b squared now is there anything in the numerator and denominator that I can factor out together to divide out of something yes there's a b squared up there and there's a b squared down there so this is actually equal to b squared times uh, b squared over b squared times qa minus a squared over a oh look right there that's a one one times anything it doesn't change anything so you could divide out a b squared but I see more, I can factor out way more. I could have said, looking at this original one, I see a common factor of A and B squared. So I can factor that out. And I'm left with two minus A all over A, B squared. Is there one in there somewhere that I can factor out? Yes. That's a one, it goes away. What are we left with? Just two minus a. You don't have to put it over a one. So it's taken to be over a one. Okay. I didn't write that, but you, it's taken to be over one. Like any number you can write as that number over one, it's the same thing. So be honest. Did this clarify anything for any of you in here? Yes. Okay. So this is something that you all have to do throughout. Like this semester. Like if there's something that like you've been iffy about in the past, the time to ask is probably with me. Because I struggled with math a lot when I was growing up. So I know what it's like to not know these things. And professors or teachers just do them because they assume that you know them, right? So um, by all means, always ask things, even if it's like simple algebra type things. Okay, so um, I think uh, that'll be it for this lecture. Let's go ahead and stop the recording.